as people are responsive and open to the truth, God, you declare in your word that if the Son has set us free, we are free indeed. But God, we serve within a broken generation of believers. We serve within a clouded, messed up, perverse nation of believers. And so I pray today that we will be called to righteousness, called to holiness, called to godliness. As we stand before you, may we realize that it's not something that we just chalk up as unreachable, but that through Christ today, we can be clothed in righteousness through Christ today. We can be made godly, made holy, made right. And so may we not stand in our own understandings, but may we get an understanding of you. Pour yourself out. And God, I pray that you'll use me to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, grab your Bibles. Let's go. I, I know a few weeks ago we started a series, but God has never given me the rights to go back to that series. And so we're not. We're not going to do it until he says to. He may not. I just challenge you to get in Matthew chapter number six and let God grow you, okay? Uh, I, there's seven keys in there that God will use in your life if you will put them into practice to open up opportunity, to open up relationship, and to open up the power that God has intended for your life. But today we're going to move forward and we're going to go to Matthew chapter number 13, and that's where we're going to take our text, and I'm going to read a little story to you that, that Jesus told. It's a parable. For those of you that are new to faith, I think we need to sometimes describe what it means when we say parable. This is an analogy, a story that Jesus used to prove a major point. It's not something that literally took place. Matter of fact, in the Bible, how you tell the difference between a parable and an analogy and a real life story is God never, Jesus never used real names in parables. He always used pronouns or examples of far farmer. I've had people come to me and say that they believe that the parable of hell where Lazarus and the rich man were was just a story Jesus told, but Jesus did not use real names in parables. That's a literal story. There is a heaven. There is a hell. Good news. Hell wasn't made for you. Heaven was. Hey, hell was made for the devil and his demons, the Bible says. However, those that reject God wind up there. And some people want to excuse that that doesn't exist. It absolutely does. But here's great news. Ready? Even more powerful than hell could ever be is the love of God. And that love is available to you today. And so in here you see Jesus telling the story. So if you would pick up with me in, in, in Matthew chapter 13 verse number 24. It says this. Here is another story that Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in the field. I want you to write in your margin, write in your notes, meaning this, that God is still planting seed today. That God is still putting a, an abundance out there. We live in a wicked world, but there's still the goodness of God, the glory of God, the grace of God, and the power of God available. And you may watch the news, and you may get caught up, and you may get broken with everything that's going on around you, the wickedness and evil that we see ra raking havoc in the lives of people that we love or in the country that we love. But today, in the midst of all of that, the farmer, which is referring to God in this story, is still planting good seed. May you and I be a seed that he planted that brings forth an abundant harvest today. But look at what it says. In verse number 25, it goes on. It says, but that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. Now, I want you to understand this, too, that, that evil is still at work, that the enemy today is still trying to plant seeds in your life, too. And the purpose of that seed is to steal from you or rob from you the intentions that God has for you and desires that God has for you. The purpose of that, that attack is so that the life that God is offering be choked out by the lies that are being offered by the world around us. Now we're going to examine the weed and the wheat today. And the question I'm asking is who are we letting plant the weeds or the seeds in our life today? And so in this, look at the, the next few verses, and then we'll back up and we'll look. We're going to read down through about verse number 30, and it says, verse 26, when the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. And the farmer's work, uh, workers went to him and said, sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? And the farmer replies, verse 28, an enemy has done this, uh, the farmer said, exclaims, so the, the workers in panic, should we pull the weeds? 
Look at this that very next verse. It says in verse number uh, uh, 20, uh, 28, the second part, it says, should we pull out all those weeds? In other words, let's run them over. Let's get it out. Let's, let's tear it up. And then and Christ speaks back. The, the farmer, God speaks back. No, you'll uproot the weed if you do. Now, I, I want you to understand something today. We are to be in the world, not of the world. And we live in a generation to where the church goes to one or two extremes. They become so much like the world you can't tell the difference, or they become so separated from the world that nobody's getting reached. And God has not called us to be either of those. He planted good seed, and I guarantee the enemy's planted his seed, and we're to be right there where that seed is, serving God and loving God. That's why today my heart is full just hearing those testimonies, and that ain't even half of them, people that have been delivered, people that have been changed. If we're all honest today, God has sanctified and redeemed every Every one of us from something and, and set us right in some area, restored something that was stolen or lost or broken in our lives. God is a good God. Do you agree with me this morning? God is faithful and God is true. And at some point, we just need to stop and say, hey, thank you, God, for being that. But we also need to realize that it is our job to make that known so that others can see that truth, too, so that others can have that hope, too. And then it goes on. Keep reading with me if you would. Verse number 30, it says, let both, both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. Now, there's several deep truths. Now, Christ later in verses 36 through 43, his disciples confused, come to him and say, hey, what was that all about? Like, tell us. And so he breaks that down, and I challenge you to go read that. But I today was drawn that through studies this past week into this, this analogy of wheat versus weed. And what is the significance that God is saying? And he's saying, hey, the kingdom needs wheat. Now, when we say wheat in our day and time, we think of our version of wheat, which is contaminated at its core. I mean, let's be honest. Most of what we re re eat in our breads and, 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 and our wheat, our, our, our manufactured chemical products, it's not the pureness of wheat that the Bible's talking about here. It's a man-made design that's made to imitate, and there are a lot of byproducts that come from that, and there's a lot of damage that can be done from that, and that's why uh, you see this great movement in our society towards gluten-free, I mean, towards getting rid of all wheat and all those things out there, because what we call wheat is not wheat. Can I just pause there and say the same thing's happening in the church? What we're calling of God is not of God, and what we're calling the truth is not the truth, and we have taken God's word and God's truth and we've chemicalized it we've man polluted it we put our own ideas and our own agendas we've taken worship that is reserved for the holiness of God and somehow made it about us and we turned it into songs about who we are and songs about what we are when it should be worship towards what he is and anytime we're singing to us and anytime we're worshiping us we're giving praise to the enemy because he's planted a weed in our churches in our lives I mean, listen, it is not a mean thing to stand on truth. Matter of fact, people that love people actually give people the truth. I've often said, if you lie to me, you're telling me you think I'm worthless. That I'm not deserving of your honesty. I'm not deserving of your truth. I'm not deserving of, of, of getting real information. As a matter of fact, if you lie to me, you're trying to guide my life in a destructive path. Yeah, in, in counseling, when somebody comes in and they only give a half-truth... They literally are trying to take control and shape up that counseling to where it fits their needs and, and it hinders. As a matter of fact, we say this honestly and all the time, if you're not going to be honest in here, then this is a waste of time. Because the reality is truth sets you free. And Jesus came to give truth. And his truth was not, I'm going to beat you down. His truth was, I'm going to raise you up. His truth isn't God is some separated way out there, doesn't want anything to do with you type of God. He says, no. Hey, but his truth was God is a father that loves his children, and he is open in adoption and willing to adopt anybody. And matter of fact, he has such a big place to live that God himself brought Jesus home so that they could keep expanding that place. John 14 says, I go, and I'm preparing that place for you. And when I come, I will you to myself that where I am there you can be also now understand this listen to me Jesus came to tell this truth that God is more valuable than anything else that your relationship with him is more profitable than anything else 
So I studied the pureness of whole wheat, 100% whole wheat, and I found this to be true. The reason wheat was so necessary back in those times, and in this time, if you can find it, is because it is loaded with nutrients that bring in different functions to your body. Number one, write this down, wheat is a fiber source. In other words, wheat can come in and, 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 and it helps with good digestive systems. It helps your body weed out what is good and what is bad. And when you have a healthy, high-fiber diet and you have a healthy digestional tract, then the things that are poisonous to your body or the things that you ingest that are not supposed to be there can be digested out and put through. And then I'm hitting there and it's like, hey, God put us in the world as wheat to turn the digestive system on in the church so that when junk comes in, it doesn't get stuck. It gets processed and put out. He says, hey, we got the light. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that God is a light, that Jesus was a light that illuminated hope? How many of you believe that today? How many of you believe that Jesus is a light that illuminates darkness? Anybody like that? How many of you believe that Jesus is a light that will lead you straight to the prosperity and the success and the comfort and the relationship that only God can give? There is a light shining today. And you know what it is? It's a source of wheat that brought fiber into our spirituality. To say, you know what? Um, the Bible says in, in Ephesians 4, write it down, we're not going there, but Ephesians 4, the Bible says that he wishes that you would grow to such maturity that you're not tossed by every new wind of doctrine. In other words, you can digest what is being said and you can find through the Holy Spirit what is good and what is not. And God did not put you and I on this earth to just keep saying what every man has said and every woman has said before. God has put us on this earth so that we can rightly divide the word of truth and get it out there and say, hey, there's some bogusness coming out of the stages of our churches. There's some lies being preached from the pulpits. There's this self-help mentality that says you can be anything you want to be. No, you can, but it's not going to be beneficial. You need to find what God created you to be because just being anything you want to be could make you totally messed up. Totally. And so God says, I'm going to plant some wheat because we need some fiber. We need something in the church that's going to start up and say, that doesn't feel right. That's not of the spirit. You know what that means? That as the fiber, we are to test the spirit of those around us. Through the Holy Spirit, we are to test every message we've ever heard. If you believe what you believe because I've said it, you're in trouble. You can ask my wife. She's here. I don't always get it right. I often get it wrong. Any other admitters to that today? I don't know everything, and neither do you. And there are people that preach with good intentions, but they preach a valid, polluted gospel. I've heard it said in many churches from reputable preachers, and we're not here to name shame. It doesn't matter. We're here to lift high the name of Jesus Christ. We're to shame off you, not shame on you. I've heard reputable preachers say, well, that's their truth, and that's what they need to hold on to. No, 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 their truth won't get them into heaven. Well, that's what they believe, and everybody's entitled to what they believe. No. Well, that's what the majority believes, and we should go with it. What if the majority wants you dead? Should we go with that? What if the majority says, let's wipe you off the face of the planet? Should we go with that? You say, well, that would never happen. Just ask Hitler. Just ask that Nazi movement, is that, is that true that that would never happen? Or did 17 million people get slaughtered in a world war that should have never taken place? Why? You say, well, you're comparing us to Hitler. No, I'm saying this. I'm comparing you to you. We are flawed by nature and therefore incapable of always getting it right. You are imperfect and so am I. Our righteousness at its best is not good enough. We fall short of the glory of God. And that is why Jesus showed up so that where we were short, he could extend our height. Where we couldn't reach, he could. And when we couldn't do, he did. And so God showed up to meet the gap that was created by our carnality and his incarnality by our mortality and his immortality. He says they can't, but we can, so let's go. 
And in there, he's planted his seed in you so that today those that don't believe they can can find that they can do all things through Christ. And those that don't believe there's hope can find that there's hope in any situation. And those that don't believe they can make it can find what they need to get up and go again. But today, if you don't know what you believe, then how can you stand on anything? I mean, most people are standing on ideas and ideas will fail you. They're standing on a good quote and a good quote will fail you. I once gave this analogy, I'll give it again. Motivational speaking is like me coming to you today and saying that you can float off the ground and all you've got to do, reach down, grab your feet and pull them up and you will float. The truth, you will for about one second while your hind end is on its gravitational fall straight to the ground. There is nothing you can do to lift yourself up today. And motivational speaking says, hey, grab yourself and pull yourself up. I'm going to tell you this now, you're going to fall down doing that. In other words, it's like this. I need him to reach into my pit of despair and pull me out and establish me on a solid rock. I need the word of truth to be the compass and guide of my life. I need him, and so therefore, I am going to digest what you say to me. You know, the Bible talks about, I was reading it this morning in Proverbs. It it, it was saying that, hey, a person of few words is considered wise just because they don't speak much. But the Bible also says the words of the wise are few, and a foolish person just spouts out the mouth. In other words, it's like this, hey, you don't have to come in here and come up with all these grand solutions for your life. Come in here, grab Jesus, and know that there's a wisdom that comes from God that no man, no woman can ever create. An understanding that comes from the Holy Spirit that nobody can ever give you not grace community church not your mama not your daddy not your grandpa not anybody and today if you're building your faith based on what you've been taught you're in trouble you're in trouble we even sing a song my hope is built on nothing less than jesus blood and righteousness i dare not trust the holy frame but i lean on jesus name on christ the solid rock i stand great song but we lie about it every time we say it Because in all honesty, if I were to ask you this question, and I don't want you to answer it out loud, why do you believe the things you believe? And if everything you believe is based on what you've heard, go test it. Because wheat brings fiber and you're supposed to digest. You ever heard the thing that didn't sit well with you? Somebody says something and you're sitting there and you're like, that doesn't sound right. How many of you have ever been there? Ever been in church and a message be preached and you're sitting there like, hmm, All of a sudden, a verse you've read in your devotions, a chapter you've read in your devotions starts ringing out in your mind, and you're sitting there saying, well, that doesn't match that. How many of you have had that happen? You know what that is? The fiber of the wheat, Holy Spirit, working in your life saying, don't inhale this. Don't keep this. Get this out of your mind. Get this out of your life, because it will harm you. You know the second benefit of wheat? Write it down. I found is not only is it a good source of fiber, but it is also a a good source of of iron. Now, I'm iron deficient in my life. Anybody else in here iron deficient? Now, iron is very important. Now, I have to take some medicine for it, and and I'm going to testify today not to the goodness of taking the medicine, but what happens when you don't. I quit uh, about three months ago taking my supplements like I was supposed to. Four iron tablets a day. Supposed to pop those in, let them do their thing. Because my iron levels and my vitamin D levels were very low. And, and iron is, listen to this, this is, uh, this is beautiful. Iron is a great transfer of the oxygen through the bloodline. And the Bible, I, I read this on, uh, on a, a government official health website. They said this, listen. That when you have the right amount of iron in your system, that the blood flow becomes so healthy that it actually fights headaches because it delivers the oxygen the brain needs to be able to function at its best. And it fights fatigue. It actually gives you energy because your, your muscles and your cells are being nourished. You know when the wheat of God has been planted and we become what God intended for us to do, the bloodline can flow very clearly. And it can give sources of strength to those who are weak. And it can give life and function, awareness to those who walked in darkness. The absence of those two uh, supplements in my life have led to me. I was telling my wife, I said, I am so tired all the time. Like I feel like I could just lay down and sleep anywhere. You know, I've actually even said things. My mind 
isn't working like it used to work. I can't keep things used to. I could have a conversation with somebody, remember what they were wearing, where they were standing, where we had it, the specific day, all the way down to their eye color. I could remember everything. And then in the past three months, I've, I've had a hard time holding on to thoughts. A lot of, I don't remember you saying that. I don't remember that happening. I don't remember saying that would be there. Uh, anybody else know what I'm talking about? That's not as old as Bill. Uh, anybody else? All right, I'm just kidding. All right, in that moment, I have this, 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 this reality. I'm sitting there, I'm studying it. And, and so I go to my wife and I'm like, hey, I'm just tired. She, and here's her response every single time. Are you taking your meds? Well, no, we'll take them. You know, because uh, we, we can't do, I know what the doctor's gonna say. You're gonna go to the doctor and the doctor's gonna say, are you taking your meds? And if you're not taking your meds, there ain't nothing the doctor can do. Because we need you to be on those for a month so we can redraw your labs and see if maybe you need an infusion. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I am a man and at this moment all I'm looking for is pity. <laughs> and a nap. Right? But the solution is, take your supplements. Take your supplements. And you know why God is planting good seed? It's because the bloodline of Christ needs to flow. And there needs to be somebody that the oxygen of God, the life of God's breath, the life of who God is, can flow through into somebody else so that they can get the life. The body is weak today. The church is weak today because the wheat is not present today. We're not getting the nourishment we need. I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, you plant good seed. There's a third benefit. Look at this. I wrote this one down. Not only is it a fiber source or an iron source, but it's a protein source. There's like five grams of protein and so many milliliters of wheat, pure wheat. And for those of you that don't understand, uh, protein strengthens and restores muscle. And protein actually, look at this, this is beautiful health magazine. Listen, protein creates satisfaction. So the metabolism continues to burn and the cravings don't take over. And I sit there and I'm like, oh God, we live in the most selfish generation, do we not? A world that is so me focused, a world that is so, if you're not for me, you're against me, and if you're against me, I'm against you. In the church, we repay evil with evil instead of conquering it with good. There's backstabbing and and lies, you say, here, I'm not talking just here. Wake up. I'm talking about throughout Christianity. There's not a unity standing for Christ. There's disunity as we're standing for our own church-branded name instead of standing for the name of God. Are you with me? And in there, we're wanting, you need to come to our church. You belong here. You do this. No, you need to get to God. You belong there. And when you get there, there's a wheat that he nourishes you with. Matter of fact, my Bible says he is my daily bread. And in there, as I inhale that bread, that grain of God, I am satisfied. And I don't need, I don't need the junk the world's offering. You say, how do I, how do I get rid of my addiction? Start feasting on Jesus and you'll get satisfied. How do I get rid of these evil thoughts, these fears, these things? Start nourishing on Jesus and you'll be satisfied. But God's not sitting here in this analogy. Christ is not talking about us needing to go get it. He's talking about us becoming it. The kingdom is like the farmer who planted the seed. Are you a good source of spiritual fiber? Are you a good source of spiritual protein? Are you a good source of spiritual iron? Or today, have we polluted the word of God? And that's why we're broken and tired and weak and worn out. And that's why we're depressed and anxious. And that's why we're victimized and all these other things. That's why we let somebody's opinion rule and govern our day. That's why we let one snide comment made by somebody dictate everything we do and everything we feel. And today, we need the Weed of God to be found and be present. So then I flipped the study, started studying the weed. Environmental.gov found this to be true. There's eight dangers that weeds create. I wrote them all down. Stay with me. I'm going to give them to you fast. You ready? The number one is that it chokes out natural life. That when a weed grows, it'll choke out the plant that needs to live. Oh, God, help us. We're letting the weed of the enemy choke out the life that God has intended for us to have. Yeah. We're letting it choke out the joy that God intended for us to have. Look at this, number two. They, they are invasive. That weeds, and I wrote this down, they take over 
everything, throwing off the natural balance necessary for an ecosystem to survive. In other words, when a weed comes in, I wrote down these thoughts, and look at this, they, they threaten, number three, the survival of all living plants, animals, and beings that will come in contact for two reasons. Number one, weeds are not affected by pests and pesticides like a natural plant because a weed is there to destroy, so therefore even pests know that there's no nourishment in attacking a weed, and instead it attacks the plant. Are you, are you following this logic? And then it goes on and it says, not only do they survive and thrive and take over, and, and they start driving out natural life because they're not affected by pesticides, but number two, they grow at a faster rate than actual natural plants grow. Because weeds will compete and win for resource. Can I say that again? Weeds will compete and win for the resource. They steal the water, this is all this website. They steal the sunlight and the space necessary for life to grow. And you say, well, let them sow their wild oats. And you say, well, they're kids. Yeah, and while they're sowing those wild oats, those weeds that the enemy's coming in to plant in their lives, it's choking out life. It's taking the space, the water of the Holy Spirit. It's taking the natural resource that they leave. It's taking everything, the food, the nutrients that they need to survive, and it's sucking it right up. And even if there's a chance for life, the weed will choke it out because the weed always grows more rapidly than the plant. Anybody else getting the spiritual awakening out of this that I was getting? I looked at my life and I said, God, I need a weed eater. I mean, I need the Holy Spirit to come in and start taking out the things that are choking me out. I need you to clean my mind. I need you to clean my heart. I need you to clean my actions. I need you to clean my desires. Hey, like David, empty me so that I can be full of you. God, I need space to grow. And right now, my man-made ideas are clouding my judgment. Anybody else in here? You want to have a moment with me? All right, now look at this. Look at the next thing, number four, that a weed does. It says that they often are excellent at surviving in disturbed and harsh environments. And I thought to myself, oh God, every rape that has ever happened planted a weed. And every, every action that has ever been done to someone, people born poor, people born broke, people born without, hey, that is a place where the weed can survive. People that have been rejected, people that have been thrown away, people that have been discarded, people that have been overlooked, it creates an environment of which the weed can survive. And they are good at growing in disturbed places. And I don't know about you, but there are a lot of disturbed places in this world. And a lot of disturbed things in this world and a lot of things that should never be happening to people are happening and a lot of things that should never be done to people are being done and today there are people who are broken by divorces and broken by, by cheating and affairs and broken by drugs and alcohol and all these things that are robbed and they stand empty and these weeds are growing so God planted the wheat he planted us and here's my problem check it the church wants to run away from those people. The church doesn't want those people. I had somebody once tell me, please don't call us the disturbed church. That's not good advertising. People don't want to go to where people are broken. Oh, it sounds like God is sifting the wheat from the weed. Because Jesus didn't go to the healthy. He went to the sick. I was one of the sick and I am so thankful that he came to the disturbed areas of the world. Yeah. The disturbed minds and the disturbed hearts and the disturbed souls. He rescues the kid from abuse and gives them purpose. Are you with me? The church should be going where the weeds are growing. The church should be running in because God has planted good seed. Number five. Weeds contaminate produce. In other words, weeds make produce inconsumable. You know why? 
People don't want the truth of God as much. And matter, matter of fact, can I back up? Let me tear down that lie that Satan's telling. People are desperately hungry for the truth. Nobody's telling it. So therefore, we say they don't want it. Well, they don't want what they don't know they, de- they don't have. Matter of fact, if you found this quote to be true, you never know how much you need Jesus until Jesus is all you got. How many of you found that in your life? And, and, and they don't know how hungry they are until somebody puts the food on the table. Yesterday I was out. My wife said, what do you want to get for lunch? I wasn't hungry. So my idea was, whatever you want, you tell me. So she sent me three lists, three things. And I was like, you tell me. My idea was if she wanted Chick-fil-A, I wasn't going to get anything. I wasn't hungry. But she said Domino's. And so she called in Domino's. And Domino's has a Philly cheesesteak pizza that I'm obsessed with. (laughs) And Domino's has a, a chicken carbonara pasta that I love. So she says, what do you want? I need nothing, but my want is great. So you know what I do? I say, I need the pizza, I need the the thing. And you know what I do? I eat half the pizza, and I eat the pasta when I don't even want it. You know what happens? All right, if food is available, even those that don't know they're hungry will eat it. Are you with me? But when we come to church, there's no food available. There's only weeds. All the things that everybody's done. Did you hear about someone? Let's pray for Glenda. Well, why? Oh, you haven't heard? (laughs) No, I'm being spiritual here. She's terrible. (laughs) You know? I'm concerned here. She's messed up. And I'm picking on Glenda. If you don't know who she is, she plays the piano. Now I've really pointed her out, right? (laughs) You know, they, they, they come in this holiness of gossip. Matter of fact, I read about gossip today. The Bible says that the mind of the liar is the one that will listen to the gossip and the slander. Proverbs. And I wrote my Bible, "Mm, what are you hungry for? I don't want to hear that garbage. I don't want to hear how bad you are. I know how bad I am. And the Bible says we're all human, so I know how bad you got to be. If I'm this messed up, you got to be messed up. If I can think like that sometimes, you can think like that sometimes. And if I can do that and say that, you can say that and do that. So stop pretending you're something better than me. I see right through you. Do you see right through me? I'm hoping because the more transparent I come, hopefully God's more seen and God's more evident because I know how messed up I am, but I'm not messed up anymore. I'm a child of God. I'm a delivered saint. I'm brought into a family that I don't belong. And so instead of claiming my identity as all the things that I've done, I'll claim my identity based on what he has done. And instead of standing in who I am, I'll stand in who he is. And when someone sees me, my prayer is that they see Jesus. And it should be the same with you. Why? Because people are hungry. Let's give them something to eat. The weeds will harm the produce. Number six, weeds can be poisonous. And here, here's the kicker. You know what they said? The danger of a poisonous weed is you cannot identify them from a non-poisonous weed. They all look the same. They all have different shapes, forms, and different plant lives, absolutely, but they all just look like weeds. And when certain, there are certain weeds that if they scrape you, they can infect your whole body. They can get in your bloodstream and kill you. There are certain weeds that if you eat them, they can cause you to go blind. You're saying, what are you saying? There's a danger when weeds are allowed because weeds are poisonous. And my Bible says, don't let any corrupt root of bitterness grow in anybody because it's corrupted too many. It's a weed. Hey, my Bible says God didn't give you the spirit of fear, but power and love sound mind. Fear's a weed. God didn't say, hey, God didn't give you the right to go talk down to somebody or about somebody. Matter of fact, the Bible says those that belittle, God will get even with in Proverbs. But it also says that those that encourage, God will lift up. Hey, understand this today. God looks at you and God looks at me and he says, hey, there needs to be no weeds. Why? Because when we have unforgiveness and we have those things, it poisons our minds. It poisons our life and it poisons the way we live. And so God plants his seed and here comes the enemy to plant his to try to poison and corrupt that is why there's a lot of people that'll go to church today and feel that they are okay because of what happened in church today but let me just say this in 1 Samuel 16 verse 14 Saul was demon possessed will you please go look at it the Bible says that God removed his spirit the spirit of the Lord left him and a treacherous torturous spirit was allowed to come in, filling him with depression and anxiety. His guys come to him and say, you're filled with a a, a torturous spirit, a troubling spirit. And so Saul goes out and hires David, who had already been anointed as the next king. 
to come in and play his harp. And in verse 23, the Bible says that when David would play, the torturing, troubling spirit of Saul would leave. But when David would leave, the spirit would return. Saul felt better not because he was good. Saul felt better because David was good. Let me drop a truth bomb on you. You may come in here and feel safe, but you ain't safe. If your safety is dependent because somebody else came in the name of the Lord. You may come in here and feel godly, but you ain't godly. Unless it became something personal in you. The Bible says laughter can hide the grieving heart, but when the laughter fades, the grief remains. You see, you know what I'm telling you? Here, here's this. That David was so full of God. Why? David played his harp in the field just to sheep. David played his harp just to praise when he was by himself. David playing in the presence of Saul was no different than David playing in the field when nobody was present. Why? Because David was playing for the Lord and nothing else. And when somebody walking in God can step into darkness, that even those that are in darkness find some relief. Why? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom and there's liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, the enemy can't stand. And that's how some of you can come into an assembly of the church where people are and feel godly, knowing good and well that you're living in such sin and such filth that you have no sense of godliness at all but when you're here you feel like you're worshiping and you're jamming and you're worshiping and then you get back out there and you start beating your wife again you get back out there and you start thinking about shooting up again you get back out there and the first thing you got on your mind is your pornography or your alcohol or you start lying and cheating and being lazy and you say don't talk about me I didn't know I was here's the thing understand it listen listen you get around the spirit of God you're going to feel the spirit of God doesn't mean you have him are you with me some point you gotta take it. Some point you gotta say, I want this worship that I feel in the presence of God's people to be the worship that I feel when I'm standing alone with God. I want a holy ground experience in front of a burning bush more than I want to be the one leading a million people out of Egypt. I want an encounter with the hand of God on a mountain more than I want to be in the comfort of else feasting and making idols and doing their things in other words hey hey at some point you got to realize that if you're got a weeded life just because you thought you're good doesn't make you good and many will hear depart from me I never knew you but not you you don't have to why because today God has planted a good seed right in front of you and if you'll take a bite if you'll take a chance if you'll give it your all God can change everything thank God for the wheat amen because the roots are the roots of those weeds, they're contaminating. Last one. Weeds cause all kinds of health problems. Anybody in here got an allergy? How many of you can tell when the dogwoods are about to bloom? You know when it's spring. Not because you watched the weather, because you started sneezing your head off. Am I right? Especially right here in the good old state of Tennessee. The air is a little thicker here, they say. Yeah, it's called pollen. Am I right? We call it allergies. It's called asthma. Matter of fact, there was an abundance of a weed this year. I don't know if you watched it in the news that was so present. And it, it, that hay fever caused all kinds of different things. And they said, the problem is it looks like a, a plant. Ooh, Paul's. Let me show you a picture. Look at the screen, if you would. I gave this to Casey. Which one's wheat and which one's weed? All right. Here's the reality. I found this. and Man, it, it moved my heart. Listen to me. Until mature, they have no real noticeable differences. Wheat, weed. Now, can I tell you this, church? Listen to me. Just because they say they know God doesn't mean they do. Just because they say they're preaching in his name doesn't mean they are. You say, how do I know the difference, maturity? Growing in Christ. Can I get this? This was one of my favorite studies. I, I'm obsessed with seeds in the Bible. So this is one of my favorites. Grab this. Listen to me. You know how you can distinguish the wheat from the tear? Because the wheat, when it reaches maturity, will bow over. And the weed will stand straight up. And you will know them by their fruits. By their words, their actions, their deeds. Are you with me? 
How do you know if somebody's of God a good wheat? They have no problem bowing down now and saying he is king of kings and lord of lords. The wheat will bow while the tear will stand trying to imitate, trying to be, but making themselves known. Hey, he shifts the wheat from the tares. Why? It's easy to tear down a tear because the wheat is already out of the way because the wheat has already bowed down. And today we need worshipers to arise that will be holy in their lives, righteous in their lives, bow in their lives to God in total surrender so that the wheat can worship and work while the weeds are totally exposed. Amen. And in our lives, listen, God has given us the Holy Spirit. Write it down. God has given us his word. God has given us a right standing with himself so that we can tell what is true and what is not. And good news, one day God's going to come back and take a harvest. And I don't know about you, but I'm going home. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm a kingdom person. Anybody else a kingdom person in here? Anybody else saved by the blood of the lamb, redeemed today? In other words, it's like this. It says in the story that he will bundle up those things that are weeds and they will be cast into the fire and they will be burned and he will bundle up the wheat and take it to the barn. Hey, I've been taken to the barn to be worn out, but I can't wait for the day he takes me to the barn to put me in his resource center, to put me in his presence, to put me in his harvest. I and you are called to be the harvest of God, not the weeds of distraction. And so I wrote down four things. I'll give them to you in closing. I'm having a good time today. Hope you are too. Yeah. Number one, I've already said it. Don't believe everything you hear. Matter of fact, test, test every sermon, thought, idea, quote, with the word of God. Number two, not everyone who says they're of the spirit is truly of the spirit of God. So therefore, judge, I'm going to use that word, their words, their actions, they're fruits. And if they are of God, their words will match his. Their fruits will match his. And their actions will match his. If they are not of God, they do not love. They do not produce the fruits that God produces. And they do not produce words that God... The Bible says your mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. In other words, your mouth is a great symbol of what your heart is. And if your mouth is perverse, then God help and he will your heart. Number three, the enemy is and will continue to try to plant weeds in your life to confuse you and to keep you from experiencing the wheat in life that God has planted for you. Every person in here needs to realize three times in Proverbs we find a verse, start in Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right to man, but the end of it is destruction. It says it again two chapters later in chapter 16. There's a way that seems right, but the end of it is death. Hey, I'm not looking for a feeling of God. I am not looking for an emotion or an emotional encounter with God. I'm just, I'm just looking to have all of God and good news. He has set the table he has served the bread, and anybody that is willing can have all of him that they want. Which brings me to the last point. I want you to remember it. That today, God has planted his wheat in us because he plans on three things happening. Write these down. Number one, that we will help others digest the truth. Fiber. We find that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Would you read this verse with me real quick? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed because we rightly divide, digest the word of truth. Number two, to help others find strength and satisfaction in their life. God has called us to be a protein source in this world. Look at this verse, Ephesians 4, verse 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those that hear them. Number three, and we close, to keep the bloodline flowing. To let the blood of Christ, the life-giving, the Bible says the power of life is in the blood. And if you want to come alive today, you need to find the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, where do I find that? For those of you that are new to faith, I do not have a bowl of it. And there is nothing you can go find in substance form that is the blood of Christ. What it's symbolizing and what it's saying is 
Will you accept the gift that Jesus gave by dying on the cross and raising for you? And will you put that into action in your life, making God not only the Savior of your life, but the Lord of your life with total control? You say, well, what does that mean? He's expecting you and I to get the gospel out there. And once it's out there to teach people how to walk in their faith, God has planted his seed today. May we not allow the enemy's seed, the weed, to keep us from being who God wants us to be and we're calling you out as warriors of God to examine yourselves are you fiber are you protein are you iron are you producing the nutrients that the world needs to be able to know and understand God on a deep intimate level do your kids see you writing in the Bible enough that they think they should write in theirs I don't mean that about me today. I mean that about this. I want you to grab it. The same kid that sees dad right in the Bible is the same kid that sees dad throw a temper tantrum. Am I working on the the wheat planting team in my son's life, my wife's life, or am I helping the weed planting team in their lives? I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. I want you to examine yourself today. We'll say goodbye to online, and I want you in-house to grab this truth. Is there anybody?